Hello and welcome to another episode of Bulldogs Unleashed, our weekly look at Rugby League and the Canterbury Bankstown Rugby League Club from behind the scenes. Our special guests this week are another lineup of great players. We've got Paul Langmack and Luke Goodwin. Thank you for joining us, gentlemen. No hey, problem, Billy. Bill. We have a lot to get through today and some great topics too. Thanks to Reclaim the Game for supporting this program, but we have a lot going on in rugby league, in particular at this very club. We would like at this point to produce a team list. That's what we're going to do in this show every week where possible. This week, it just isn't possible, Luke Goodwin. This is an injury crisis at the club. The media is full of stories about it, and you just don't see it that often, particularly when you have a range of injuries in the forwards. Yeah, it's um, we've been hit hard, that's for sure. And it shows you the resilience the club has at the moment with the depth we have, um, especially the grind out of win like we did on the weekend. But, yeah, like Thompson, Patolo, Pangai Jr., New Brown, um, you know, and then we've got Ray and Kicks out with their um, – the stand new stand and rule and Frank, uh, young Franklin Pelle broke his arm on the weekend. Then Ockham has been suspended for his hip drop. So, mate, we've got an international starting pack – uh, ineligible to play this week. So, yeah, not great. Someone texted me during the Cowboys game, we're going really well considering we've got a couple of million dollars worth of forwards on the sideline. Well, now we have a couple of million more, basically, roughly speaking. Um, Langers, uh, on that point, you played the game for a long time and you've been watching it for even longer. Um, that's a lot of key players out in a particular area of the park, basically. That's another aspect of it, isn't it? Oh, for sure. But I think... If it happened last year or over the last five years, the club would capitulate. But now with uh, what Phil Gould's done, um, bringing players, um, we showed a lot of resilience. And, uh, you know, we're three out of five. I think it's the best start since 2016. Would that be right, Lucy? Oh, Luke, sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, yes, that's Paul. true, isn't it? Yeah, no, it is. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, look, I think the um, – the Bulldogs are getting back to how our, the fans expect them to be. Mm. Um, when I played here, success was demanded um, and now it is demanded. And um, I think we'll be right because we love playing South and the supporters love playing South and so do the South supporters and it's going to be awesome. You know, we'll probably be 35,000 people there and um, – that's why you play footy, when the, um, against the odds is the best. We'll have a lot more to say about that game a little later in the program, but let's deal with what's at hand. And you made the point, Lang, is that it's it's part of the club's DNA to build depth, create depth and maintain depth. And and in the years that we've been very successful, the lower grades have also been successful. So Always. New South Wales Cup's been very strong so far this season. And boy, that talent is going to be tapped to the max. There's even been special dispensation asked of the NRL, and I think – it's only fair that they would grant that, that we can tap into that depth to try and fill the roster for the weekend. Yeah, it already has. And I know they're down there today, you know, talking about it. So, yeah, it's it's going to be – it's stretched. Um, it is good. Our New South Wales Cup are coming first. The flag are coming first too. So there is some depth there. But, yeah, I know this week, yeah, we will be stretched for sure. I know South have got a few outs as well. I don't know the full details of how many and – just to what extent they'll be right, because it's a short turnaround, particularly for us. But um, Langers, this also creates opportunity. There are players who may not think they're ready, but we're going to have to make sure they know they're ready in a couple of days. For sure. And look, it's every player's dream uh, to play first grade as a kid if you follow if you play rugby league. And it's an opportunity that you, you get. You've got to take it with both your hands. Um, I remember in... Um, uh, 70s? No, 84. No. 84. Uh, we'll get to you later. <laughs> anyway, in 1984, Mick Potter played every position in the back line in yeah, second grade except fullback. Except fullback. <laughs> now, this is what happened. Yeah. So I can't remember who the fullback was got injured in first grade. Warren Ryan went up to him and said, have you ever played fullback? He went, yep. Glenn Burgess, maybe? Glenn Burgess played for St. George, you idiot. Who are you talking about? You just said Mick Potter. He played for Canterbury. Oh, yeah, sorry. 1984. Yeah, later, later. No, no, it was later we played with the later, Dragons. Yeah. Yeah, and you so. work in well-being. You're all right. We're going to talk about HIA later, right? <laughs> so before I was rudely interrupted by uh, uh, the welfare manager here, um, where was I? Talking about Mick coming Mick in. Potter he played hadn't, played Potter, fullback. hadn't yeah. played fullback yeah. in his, all his life. Played against four. Potts at St. Greg's. He was a centre, 5'8", right? And 
He said, Warren Ryan said, you played fullback before? He said, yeah, mate, played it all my, all my life, right? And that year, he got the Dalian Player of the Year and we won the comp. you got to take opportunity. That's crazy. And if someone says, can you play? you got to go, yeah, I can do it, mate. I won't let you down. And well, that's how we got our opportunity. It was always through yeah. an injury. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's just how it is. That's so, right. yeah, there's going to be, you know, and that's the mentality we have here at the moment is next person up is ready. So how many times did you suffer concussion? Because <laughs> you're struggling. <laughs> no, nah, well, we it. spoke about your sport potty and I was going to the St George days instead of now the listen, Bulldogs. This is a Canterbury, Sorry, Michael. Canterbury supporters fun social media. Yeah, okay. And you're talking about St George. Like, hello. Listen, I was born Have into – Have I got a St George shirt on? I was born into the Red V, so I apologise, Paul. Let's, um, let's talk about resilience. <laughs> and that was certainly evident in the match against the Cowboys, a game where – even the keenest observer just felt like, in the context of the last few years, mm. how are we going to win this game? How are we going to win this game? Particularly as we drifted into that last 20 minutes where, of course, it's been a, 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 a desert for this team for the we first few rounds. Haven't points. scored yeah. And the only team not to have done so. But, wow. I, I was more than pleasantly, I, I can't say surprised because you could see it in the players that, that, that they have an attitude this yeah. year that's really impressive. But at the same time, they had so many obstacles to overcome. In the game, we had some of the injuries we've just been talking about. Well, we lost. The bench was shortened. Yeah. Ockenbore had been yellow carded for a while. Yeah. But yeah. But Bill, that's why the big time players get the big dollars, right? You look at the Melbourne Storm, mm. Harry Grant, Munster, they step up every week. Yeah. And the two players, or the three players who stepped up and led the way were Reed Marnie, Addo Carr, and Burton. All right, mm. um, and that's why they get paid a good dollars because they're winners. Mm. But you're right. We we, and we lost kick a couple of days before mm. kick off. We lost Ray early. We have a sin bidding, wet conditions. The boys, man, I was that proud. And and I don't think we've had a win like that since I've been at the club. The way we grind, you know, really grinded out the win. Um, it was amazing. I know it sounds disingenuous to other fans, but it was a real Bulldogs win. Yeah. I mean, it was straight out of the '80s, for example. Um, yeah. It was very similar. To the Cowboys Grand Final, where Thurston kicked, hit the yeah. post, mm. and stuffed up by Burton did. Well, not stuffed up; they didn't get just the, missed. Yeah. yeah, and then minutes later, they're a hero by kicking the field goal. Yeah, it, it was amazing because yeah, it? Um, it was wet and he's dropped it on the thirty. It's gone side. Mate, it was Black a great kick. It. it wasn't in front. It was nah. like yeah. You mentioned the team leaders, um, but what about a couple of other names on the fringe? Uh, Joshy Reynolds coming in, playing in the middle in, yeah. in, in a game where the Cowboys. For some reason, decided that's where the game would be won. They were rolling through there all game. Maybe they shouldn't have. Maybe yeah. that was to their downfall in the end. But anyway, that's what they were doing. And at times there, it looked like it was going to pay off. It got a bit fragile uh, yeah, late no, in the game. It, Josh yeah. comes on. Ockenbaugh had been back on, of course, yeah. uh, for some time. He was only a sin bent early. But he's only new in the middle. And then young Kurt Morin. Comes yeah. in. He hasn't seen a lot of first grade um, this year. No. And um, and gee, I, I was impressed with those blokes as well. Is that fair enough? Yeah. No. They'll. T and then you probably missed one player there who he's been outstanding, or he's he surprised me. And when Gus first signed him to our club, he said, "Watch this kid." I said, "Okay, young Jacob Preston." Oh well, I was going to get to him because yeah. he scored a couple of meat yeah, pies he, as well. But yeah. yeah, and he's been playing eighty minutes. He's never played first grade until this year. But yeah, Moz he's got a massive heart, Moz. Mm. Um, you know, he's. He's the uh, young nephew, Brad, one of our former players. Um, but, yeah, definitely, mate, those three you mentioned, been outstanding. Ox, it's his second game in the back row. He played a lot of game time. So, And that said, um, as far as Cameron Serraldo is concerned, uh, I might be slightly out here, but I counted at least four times uh, where the Bulldogs did have good position. They were inside the 20. They were moving the ball well and yet turned it over. In two of those occasions – uh, the Cowboys actually made a lot of ground in counter-attack having picked up a drop ball or an intercept. So there were opportunities there that y you would think at the time, oh, no, in a close game, is that the chance we've missed? Yeah. But it wasn't. And and that that's resilience too, isn't it? It's overcoming those little setbacks in a game that can turn you around and you know you've got to defend now. Well, I think the Bulldogs, they're not playing to their potential. Yeah. Right? Which is good because we're winning games. Mm. And winning breeds confidence – and when you're confident, you win. You win when sometimes when you don't deserve it, right? Where over the last five years, whatever, that would never happen. Mm. And so Cameron, uh, the coach, has installed this resilience in the team. Belief. In the club mm. and in the fans of believing it. 
it's like the, the West Tigers, right? They've got no hope now, right? Because the media are into them, their fans are into them. And if I'm a player, it's you subconsciously think, oh, I can't win. You do think about it. You can't for win, sure. right? And they say, oh, we don't look at media, please, right? But now look, there's going to be an extra five, ten thousand 10,000 people on Friday because the Bulldogs won in such an unbelievable result of the finish of the yeah, game. circumstances, right? yeah. So – it's a big game that you want to play in. And uh, we're three from five where this time last year we weren't, or the year before, the year before, One. and the fans are a bit negative. Mm. But now they're seeing light at the end of the tunnel going, hey, we're going all right here. We're, we're coming eighth. Mm. Like, we're only, you know, it's... That's an interesting point, Langers, because you, you talk about in any game taking the crowd out of the game by getting a score on your opponents early, if it's an away game particularly. In this case... For the last few seasons, it's fair to say, the crowd's been almost taken out. Yeah. Uh, what, yeah. the, 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 the faithful who have showed up to the home games have been a little more subdued because, as you say, there hasn't been that confidence there. But, boy, there's going to be a lot of noise yeah. Mate, the at drummers the Accor Stadium this weekend. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It was pretty cool. But you had to think, too, we had a, uh, a short turnaround. We went to New Zealand. We had five days in New Zealand. Unlucky loss. Mm. Lost a couple of players there. Then to come back and turn it around. So when you look at the bigger picture, mate, it was a great result for the club. Well, let's steer towards this Good Friday game. It's become a tradition now, and and these two great clubs that have turned on some pretty, well, some seriously fiery games. Remember the big James Graham Adam Reynolds clash uh, a few years back. But there's been plenty more other stuff. Going Funny story on. that Bill. Yeah. So the day after that, Bryson played in that game. My, my brother for South. And the day after that game, we had a, a big family barbecue at my house. And it come out in the paper, uh, had who scored the tries. <laughs> and it had Luke Goodwin kicking the winning goal. Oh, he's filthy. Still filthy. <laughs> it was a great kick, Langers. <laughs> yeah, it would have been. <laughs> but, but, he, but there's great history between the clubs. 69 grand. Yeah. Uh, 60. Um, no, 70. What we play oh, I'm going to talk about that later. Where, 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 oh, what, where the Bulldogs ended at St. George's Bill, winning you're the, streak. No, no, no. That's okay. <laughs> sorry, mate. Yeah. Well, just so you know, we're going to go yeah. further back in time later yeah. to a couple of – Significant moments uh, with with South and the Bulldogs, and, and we're going to talk about the Bulldogs of the eighties. But I wanted to get on to um, uh, what the occasion means now for this weekend and where both clubs are. We're actually ahead of them on the ladder, but they are a formidable team. They really need to win, and they do have some dynamic players who have punished us severely uh, in in recent times. So it's uh, and, and we've only won twice from the last eleven matches against South. Thanks to Darren Andrews for providing uh, some more little interesting stats for us this week. Interestingly, Alex Johnston has scored in the last eight consecutive Dog South matches. He scored ten tries, but I don't think he's going to get to this no, weekend's HIA. game. HIA. So yeah. that's a streak that we don't have to worry about. The only problem is the fullback. He goes all right. Yeah, and he didn't have a good game <laughs> last week. Yeah, he, 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 he didn't get involved last week. Like yeah. Latrell. When he wants to play, it's like a 17-year-old playing against 10-year-olds, right? He is, he's unstoppable. Well, the last game last year, yeah. he was very quiet, quiet. Then, and he, then he exploded yeah. in about a 10-minute space, three tries, we're gone. But I yeah. think Melbourne Storm last week, they did it right. Latrell's not the fittest player in the team. The fullback should be, but he's not. Mm. It's, but he's an unbelievable player, right? If you kick early all the time. And to him. You tie him out. Mm. And he's too tired. He won't run. You won't find him in the game if you kick fourth, third tackle every now and then because then he'll start throwing the ball to the wing and go, mate, I can't run. I'm here to score tries. And you, you cancel him out of the game. What other things can be done? Because obviously we have to approach this game with uh, a, most likely a, a, an inexperienced forward pack yeah. or at least some of them. And, um, and numbers down, I don't know how that affects the interchange as well, what we're going to see. But is that going to change the way Cameron Serraldo approaches this game or not? No, it's all about field position and holding the ball. We've got to complete sets because we don't have, like you said, we don't have the players this week. Um, and these young guys coming in, we don't want to be tackling all day. But I think you got yeah. it wrong. We're, we're saying, oh, it's bad, we haven't got the players. But we have got the players. No, they're Bulldogs, right? And you've got to go out there. No, I'm not trying no, to be No, no more experience. No, 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 like, you will excel if you don't. There, of course. If you don't freeze, right? So, let's give our players uh, or acknowledge that they can do it instead mm. of saying, "Oh, we got." The, well, they, they wouldn't the be forwards. picked if they could. Well, they wouldn't do be it. in the top thirty, top yep. thirty squad. Yeah. yeah. Serraldo and Gus wouldn't have them. So, 
if they think they're good enough, we should believe they're good enough. Yeah. And so what role do you as a senior player play out there? What are the Reed Marnies? Just Reed, oh, no, but Reed Marnie, I reckon, has been the best boy in the last 10 years. He tries every game. He's one of our best players. Mm. Is He'll just do it and just say, look, follow me, boys. Big call, Paulie. Yeah, right. Hey? Biggest signing in the last 10 years. The best. The best. Well, tell me who's better. <laughs> Come on. Oh, there's a guy on the wing and the guy that kicked no, the field no, goal no, go, no. all right? Because, mate, it's like – James a, Graham, no, all right? No, 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 no. But he, he only played four years here, right? Anyway, how many did you play? <laughs> Paul, you're getting off the subject. Keep no, going. but what I'm saying, it, it's like yeah. when you throw a rock into a, into a pond, right? Yep. Where's the biggest waves? Right where the rock went. And that's yep. why Reed Marnie can, is so important there and Nine is so too. important, yep. right? If Reed and Marnie is not any good at what he does, Josh Adekar won't get the opportunities. Yeah, 100%. So – do you take back that? I oh, know I don't. It's a big. No, Adekar's a, a great player, yeah. but I'm just saying for oh, not, the yeah. way the game is, you, you, the nine, and the seven, and uh, are the most important. Nine, people. seven, one. Yeah, but massive. they are dependent yeah. on having big front rowers, which our front rowers are out at the moment. Yeah. of going forward, yeah. and if they go forward, they create opportunities for the nine and the seven. Monday's so do we? You with us, Bill? Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. I'm with you. But do we play? Do we play walk style, or do we do we get into the grind, or do we play entertainer's style? Because we have used the ball very well this year. We just got to keep playing the way we're playing so and just have do belief. The same. Yep. Have well, belief. Well, the backs we don't have injuries in the backs, mm. so let's play yeah, play footy. You know? they, they have been good in getting out yeah. of our territory oh, yeah. this year. And then like I know all clubs use their backs now that way, but. Ours have been very effective. But on the weekend, it was good to see, um, you know, Birdo chip and chase, like that mm. unscripted stuff, the stuff that that I probably got dropped for. But, but I love yeah. that type of stuff. Just play a bit of footy. It was great. But the, the, some teams, the poor, poorly coached teams, go spread the ball mm. and go sideways and it looks pretty but it achieves nothing. Yeah. Where mm. we used to kind of do that in the past years. But now we do it for a reason. Yeah, which is good. We load up and then boom. Yeah, and and as you say, Lang, is that there's still so much potential in that team in terms of attack. Um, mm. We've known that it hasn't quite clicked a lot of times. They're still doing very well with it. Now, before we move on, just got to let you know what's happening around the game because it's a massive weekend for a lot of reasons. So not only is it Good Friday, but that means a lot of things. New South Wales Cup 140 kickoff uh, against Souths. It's round six. And the dogs are in very good shape on the ladder there. And I don't know what that team's going to look like because they're going to have to contribute to the first grade side. Harvey Norman women's are playing the Roosters on Saturday at Belmore. Uh, please get to that game. It's round 10, getting to a critical stage. 1 p.m. kickoff there. Second last round. Final round they play Mounties and that's on the road. And then, of course, it's the semifinals. So let's build that team up to a big finish for their comp. And Tasha Gale Cup, it was moved due to the wet weather last week, but they did play the game uh, and they did win that game. So they're on top of the ladder too. So they're looking strong. Now, a couple of other things too. Um, um, we've, uh, we've got transport issues on the weekend in the sense that it's also the Royal Easter show on. Yeah. The car park is already booked out. So if you haven't already made arrangements to park at the game, uh, there are places you can park at a, other train stations and jump yeah. on the train or get a bus from wherever you are. So please have a look at transport.com. Uh, to find out all the details for that. Uh, the match partner is Supporting Disabilities Australia, and we want to give them as much publicity as possible. Their website is sdaus.net.au. We want you to know how great their work is in the community. They're our supporting partner for this particular game, so please help Supporting Disabilities Australia. And don't forget, be patient. It is Royal Easter Show time. Uh, there'll be people everywhere. It'll be busy. It'll be crowded. So make sure you plan uh, your journey to um, Accor Stadium because it, it will be an amazing event, uh, the Bulldogs taking on South Sydney. We're still with Paul Langmack and Luke Goodwin when we come back and we'll be having a look at the headlines and there's some really interesting issues to discuss. We can't wait to face one of our biggest rivals, the Rabbitohs. And we're looking forward to taking on the Bulldogs. Even though we're rivals on the field. Off the field, we've united to take a stand. And say no to sports speeding sponsorships. We want you to be able to enjoy sport without betting ads getting in the way. If betting is an issue for you, help is close at hand. Visit Gamble Aware or call 1800 858 858. Don't let a bet take you away from the match. Reclaim the game and be Gamble Aware. This week's headlines. Bulldogs Unleashed, brought to you by Reclaim the Game, and we're going to the headlines now. We're talking about issues in the game, and I guess one of the most interesting ones on a number of levels is HIA, and I don't think anyone has a problem 
with the way it's been handled this year because the safety of the players is what is paramount. But one thing we thought would be interesting to talk about, and it relates particularly to this club, is HIA outside of the games, that is in training. And we've had a couple of players, Luke, this season who've had head knocks at yeah. training. And I suppose there's always the pressure on the clubs if they have head knocks at training to not disclose. Now, I'm not suggesting any club would put their performances before the welfare of their players, but maybe, just maybe, their diagnosis might be a little looser if if the head knock doesn't happen under the scrutiny of these independent doctors. Now, the Bulldogs have been really upfront with this, though, twice yeah. this year, haven't they? Yeah, we have. Just the last um, a couple of weeks ago, Franklin Pelle, he got a minor knock, um, passed all the tests, um, but because we know a bit about his history, we said, mate, you know, for the well-being of the player um, and his health, you know, we decided to do it. That, that come from the coach, actually. He was the one right. that led that. Um, and then again, last week we had kicks. Same thing was probably, um, you know, it wasn't a massive knock. Um, yeah, went through the protocols again and, and obviously the coach said no, you know, and big call for the coach to make. It's, it's uh, you know, if you look at it from a football um, point of view because it's 11-day sit-down, um, but, you know, that's – I'm going to be honest, that's what I love about our coach. He, um, you know, the, the the care he has for the players and the players know that. That's why the, you see the, the whole place, you know, it's really thriving at the moment because of the belief he's put in all the players and the, and the way he backs us. And one of the reasons it's particularly intense is because now the circumstances are we really need Villy on the park, but yeah. we're, we're doing the right thing. Langers, back in the day, uh, boy, oh, boy, how different was it? Well, I remember in my first year at the Dogs, out of school, I was playing first grade. I got knocked out six times in the first year and never missed the game. I always I remember going in the game with a bit of a headache, like sore head, and you weren't – you're thinking, oh, I hope I didn't get smashed today. Uh, and it was true. And um, and you were very – you were one of the youngest players to rack up 100 games in yeah. the NRL. You, no, the you, fastest. Fastest. You, you told me that before we went on. But anyway, <laughs> no, but what I'm saying <laughs> – Luke told you not to say it because you thought <laughs> my head would get big, girl, right? I didn't get but you head did like... everything in your first year. No, I got you won. You play NRL debut, grand final. No, no. First year we we got I got beat twenty six nil in the final when Eric Gross scored that great try. Ah, okay. When we won the comp the following year, uh, but yeah, I, I remember like you still weren't right mm. going in the play. I never missed the game, um, um, but you just said, "Oh well, it's all right." got to be tough, you know, and mm. they didn't really kind of check you. So um, I think it's great um, what the uh, NRL are doing and the Bulldogs. Like, we're talking about people's lives here, you yeah. know. It's like, yeah. but when a concussion comes, you got to take away the sport and go, is it all right for him? Mm. You know what I mean? So, and that's why, may, I'm not trying to be corny, it could be a family club that we look after. With Serraldo, he's a very uh, caring person, he's a great fellow. Um, and you say, well, how would you know? You haven't been coached by him. But the Saturday before the grand final, we went to Arthur Laundie's pub, the locker room, uh, mm. and there was about 30 past players who won grand finals, and he wanted to know what it was like. And, yeah, that's where we got to know mm. him. So, so the really question good. he put to everyone, because I organised yeah. the day, was, you know, what makes up our club? Why is the Bulldogs so special? What's in our DNA? It, it was amazing. Yeah, that, was so day, that was day one. Of his uh, time, and we with the had Bulldogs. a trainer. I think the first person who brought success to the Bulldogs was Bob McCarthy and Gary Stevens when they come to Canterbury in the late seventies oh, under that. Malcolm Cliff, right? I remember because that. Yeah. they played for Australia. They were winners, mm. and so people like that, you go, mate. You watch people like that train. You train with them. You start to learn, right? Yeah. And then we had a trainer called Dave Cooper. Uh, got his champion fella, and we trained the hardest. So when you went to the Bulldogs, it was like going to Melbourne Storm, where everyone knows you train hard. Mm. We thought every other club did, but they didn't train like us. Like, mm. um, man, it was torture. Like, and if you weren't the senior players, like I, um, we're getting off track here, but oh no, no, no. But when I'm, I hate it. The, the term culture is loosely used, yeah, right? Yeah. Like clubs that have culture don't talk about. It. Because the senior players drive it, mm. right? If your senior players aren't the fittest and train the hardest in the club, you're not going to have a good year. Because young players learn, players learn more off other players than they do off the coach. Here's, here's a question. In those days, 
that fitness thing was was massive because it was still a part time game. Yeah, everyone yeah. had full time jobs to go to. Well, mostly anyway. Some had those kind of jobs where they were just you know rolling beer barrels at the footy club or whatever. But yeah. the 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 point there is that there was a bit of latitude between clubs as to how much you trained. Now, of course, it's full time professionalism. Yeah. How do you find that edge in fitness? What are they looking for these days to to be a little bit better than the other team physically? Yeah, well, I think it's in your recruitment because, like. You can have all the stats in the world, right? And this is where we've fallen down in the last – since 2000. When was the last time we won? 204. 204. Yeah, 204. Um, is we've bought other teams' problems. If you're a problem child at another club, mm. you ain't going to be changing overnight coming to the docks where we're now buying the Jacob Prestons of the world or young fellas and we're developing them as a bulldog. Mm. They don't mm. know any better. You know, so um, when I was at the Bulldogs, we trained that hard. I remember in the 84 grand final, this is Fair Dinkum, we're playing Parramatta and on the Sunday, Friday afternoon, we go to the New York Police Boys and do boxing sessions in the mm. ring with Jeff Fennick and Johnny Lewis. Yeah. But we were so fit and tough, like, yep. We didn't complain. We thought that'll make us win. Yeah. So you imagine that happening today. The high performance manager, he'd, he'd be on the floor fainting. Yeah. So you can't do that. <laughs> Mate, we trained. We yeah. had to have a three minute yeah. round in the ring and on the bags Friday before the grand final. Yeah. And he's right. It's, you know, with our junior rep program, we get the kids in early and we have a player manual and it's called Triple B, Building Better Bulldogs. Right. So that's our motto and that's what we want to do. So we know. If we build better bulldogs, by the time Cameron gets them in that top thirty, they're gonna we're gonna create good habits with them. They're gonna be good people, which is the main thing. Mm. So when we do go out there and try and recruit a player, you know, we had a player just downstairs this morning, um, you know, with his mum and dad. So we do some homework where he's from, his mum and dad, and stuff like that. So yeah, it's a bit of a holistic approach. So we look at all the different areas that, that make up this kid's, um, you know. Oh, well, I agree because what I was trying to get at too. And- is that all the stats and the kid runs 100 metres here and there and that, mate, if he's not a good character of a kid, if he's mm. a dickhead, you can't sign him No, because yeah. he's going to be a trouble. Yeah. And, like, remember the Swans, no dickhead policy you know, yep. when they were successful. Yep. And it's so true, mate. Still is successful. doesn't matter how good you are. If you're not a good person off the field, yep. we don't want you. Yeah. It, yep. it, it, it is productive. It yeah. is actually – it's not just, you know – uh, a, a, a feel-good statement. It actually no. works in terms of producing a, a winning football like team. Like Jack Gibson used to say, if you're not working, this is when they yeah. – went, right? You're not working and if you're not a good bloke, you're not going to be a good player. He doesn't want you. Yeah. And that's, that's some, what yeah, you work Creating bad habits, yeah. yeah. Speaking of bad habits, I, I – Ed Sheeran. Something that <laughs> – so I couldn't help myself. I went to his concert. It was amazing. I was with you. Yeah, no, how good. Um, I, you know, he's, I'm not, nothing against Ed Sheeran, but I'm not Can a concert guy. Can I just say my thing? You, well, yeah. you look like a twin brother of Peter Tuck's. Really? Yeah. He, but he about, tucks, he's looking like you. But about one wow. hundred. But about but about one hundredth is tough. Yeah. Anyway, and um, size. if that. Uh, and size as well. Mm. Uh, I want to talk about. Um, I saw an incident in the game against the Cowboys, and no disrespect at all to. To Kyle Felt, but there was he was clearly run off the ball, uh, trying to you know get a get a bomb, defuse a bomb, and uh, but he did overreact to it to make sure the ref saw it. And he's not the only player who does this. Um, we've seen it a number of games this year, and I'm sure on occasion our players have probably done it too when they felt like the ref needed to see something. Now we're talking here about not faking it, not flopping, but legitimate penalties. That they're definite penalties, but the player exaggerating the effect to make sure the ref sees it. Not a new topic in the game. Do you like it though? Uh, is it necessary? Is it is it just part of sport now? Well, they're the rule changes. So like any coach, like any player, you you know what the rules are. Um, so they now react to what's going to work for them. Mm. Yeah, so... So you can't blame them, you're saying? Well, I, I don't think you can blame them. Um, you know, did I do it in the day? Yeah, I was a bit, bit of a different cat. Yeah, so I would look like I was dying, you know, if, if someone even pushed me but. But that's the rule changes, yep. and that's what happens. So yeah, you know, Cole, Cole Flanagan put his hands on him, and he, and he did. That was in the like, Tom Travoyevich incident in game yeah, one. Yeah, looks like um, he was pushed into the grandstand. But Cole, when you look back at it, Cole hardly touched him. Hmm. So yeah, it, it's a hard one. Um, you know, with stuff like that, if he changes his line, you know, they're the rules. He's not meant still, to. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah. It's not. We're not suggesting at all. Yeah. The players have created something out of no, nothing. No, no, no. 
but they just want to make sure the referee saw it. It's been going on for a long time. Some players don't do what they langers do, though. And I guess it depends on the moment. If you feel yeah. like if you get back on your feet quickly, for example, and get a quick play the ball, or you can get a pass away or something, then it's probably more advantageous to let it yeah, go. But at the end of the but day, I don't know. Yeah. If you're a winner, you'll do anything to win. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I'm going to make sure I do this really good so we get a penalty. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I, you can't blame them. Mm. Like, no, I, I, that's what like, I mean. You're there to win. You know what I mean? So you're not cheating or breaking yeah. the rules. You just you're a penalty is a penalty. So yeah. 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 yeah, but like the crusher tackles, Billy. Like sometimes a player reverses back into me. Yeah, yeah. What am I meant to do? I can't disappear. Yeah. And he and then he gets up holding his head. You know, and I was great to see. You know, no disrespect to Kyle Feld again. <laughs> he did it on the weekend. I thought, here we go. We're going to get it. They've stopped it. He was going down. But you know, to their yeah. credit, he said no. You know, it but wasn't can, a penalty. I, I common sense is. Starting to go, not just out of the game, but out of life, right? It's very rare these days, right? Yeah. Gus said that. Oh, yeah. Did he? yeah, I agree yeah. with that. Oh, said, so, but what about this one? I'm with Arthur Laundy watching the game, right? And Cohen Hess, you saw. I thought he was playing basketball. Bounce the ball, right? The oh, linesman and the ref put it, give it a, a try. try. They yeah. should be sacked. <laughs> no, because they wasted everybody's well, time. That's arguably they, they, they wasted people's time. That's arguably because the more assistance you now give the refs through the bunker, they and don't everything, make the tough calls. It's it, mm. it they become less and less durable when it comes to actually reading the game. Uh, and I'm but not like, pinning I don't blame them either the because no, no. if I've got them upstairs, I'd go upstairs. Yep, why not? See, yeah. I work with Gavin Badger at New South Wales Rugby League, yep. and I mm. say they should get rid of the microphones off the referees because they would ref better. They've got mm. to watch what they say because people say, oh, he's favouring that side the way he's talking to that play. So it's very hard. I like the around. NFL rest oh, where they press their button and go, yeah. we made this decision yeah. because That's of right. They, I, they shouldn't have mics, mate. I do feel sorry for them because a lot of times their, intu- their intuition, uh, their judgment yeah. of what, what actually took place there in terms of a bloke, you know, exaggerating yeah. something that wasn't much – um, quite but often Bill, the refs are right if they've had that experience. You can't feel sorry for them. They made that decision. <laughs> they made a decision to be a referee. And yeah, I used true. to say, I remember doing a talk one day with Bill Harrigan, right? And he, any time I got set off, he sent me off at Brookvale Label. I got exonerated, right? Bullfrog got me off. It was a joke, right? <laughs> anyway, we had to, and I got off, and next minute, a couple of years after I retired, me and him have to get on a plane and go and do a talk in Canberra. And he wants to be my best mate. This is a bloke who sent me off, right? That whole grudge is No, no. <laughs> so we go down. He says, mate, do you want to talk first or will I? I go, no, no, you talk first. I thought I'll get him. You'll right? finish so off on So he gets up. He gets up. He talks. They're all going, yeah, great, boring, right, get off. So I get up there. I go, my old man taught me there's two people you can't trust. Referees and coppers and Bill Harrigan, your are both. both. <laughs> <laughs> and I got him. <laughs> but they, it's their decision to be a ref. I would yeah. love for them to be interviewed after games. Exactly. Have a press conference. You like, that would be really good. But Just to say, well, why did you come to this decision and, and stuff? That no, would, you know, I'd like to know. We're what? advanced everywhere in the game bar that. But doesn't Graham Annesley do that on Mondays now? Is oh, that please. sort of the reason he does that? But why did this one? Why aren't the um, people in the bunker question on their decisions? Mm. Well, same, Seriously. same, yeah. No, they're, they're I, more because they're getting on tries. They go, oh, it's touch and go. Like if I'm in the bunker, if I was working, not they, no one does it. But if I was in the bunker and my mates bet, and I'm thinking, oh, they need that try. It's fit, like, <laughs> no one questions it. <laughs> I'm not admit. questioning the integrity of the bunker. Yeah, 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 yeah. Why yeah. don't they get interviewed? Well, as, Gra- as Graham said last week, and we talked about it on this show, there were a couple of calls that were very controversial, and he pointed out and said they could have gone either way. And 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 you That's still would good. have had argument. And you still would have had yeah, the yeah. referee yeah, saying, human, "Well, human so yeah. it's that kind of game. It's never black and white, is it? It's it's not easy. They're it's just not, doing yeah. their best. And yeah. We all make mistakes. Players yeah. make mistakes. Refs make mistakes. It's life." This is Paul Langmack and Luke Goodwin unleashed big time. <laughs> I mean, they're wide off that leash. They don't even know where the leash is anymore. We'll be back to go in the sheds. Let's go in the sheds. This is Bulldogs Unleashed, brought to you by Reclaim the Game, and now we are heading in the sheds. And these guys, Paul Langmack and Luke Goodwin, are particularly interesting when we talk about well-being. Now, that's your official job, Luke, uh, with the Bulldogs. And Langers, you've done it for New South Wales Rugby League as well. So, Luke, we'll start with you because we've yeah. had you on the show before, but we didn't get a chance to explore, even though we introduced you as the, the head of well-being, just what it is. Yeah, it's a big part, a big makeup of, of our game and society now. So, yeah, pretty much I, I was the head of wellbeing for the club and now I just concentrate um, the NRL wellbeing. 
um, with the players. And in a nutshell, it's, it's, it's a holistic approach. We look at the eight different dimensions that we believe uh, make up and help an elite athlete, you know. So we look at stuff like career, relationships, um, finances, physical, cultural, community, um, psychological. So there's all these different um, dimensions we look at, but they all coincide. Um, so out of that, so we, we have a, some surveys that we get the players to fill out, um, me chatting with the players and building a relationship. Then we build a, a bit of a wellbeing plan um, with the players. So and, and the plan's built by them from the um, from the sit down chat we have, and then also from the results from the survey. So you know, it's all their values and strengths built. It's not me saying, you know, this is a goal you should have. It's right. all built by them. And 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 we found because when they build it and they own it, you know, they start they'll execute you know the plan to a T. That is really deep. Mm. Have you found that, Langus? I mean, no, um, so I've worked at New South Wales Rugby League for eleven years, a um, couple of days ago. And congratulations! You think seven mm. years ago I got cancer here uh, of the thyroid, and um, through my struggles, bit of depression and that, I come out and I thought I can make a difference to people's lives. So mm. I spoke to David Trodden, our CEO, said, "Mate, I reckon I can help people playing rugby league about about this." And he goes, "Yeah, go for it." So. Um, I talk to uh, players from 11 years up, boys and girls, all over New South Wales and schools now, um, and I have a qualified social worker that comes with me, and we talk about how to improve your mental fitness. Mm. Uh, I don't call it mental health or mental illness because it's a negative term. Like if I say oh, I'm coming to the school to talk about mental health, oh, what's wrong with them? But mm. mental fitness sounds sporty, it's very positive. So everyone in New South Wales calls it mental fitness. Um, I do it for the dogs too. New South Wales partnered up with the Bulldogs through Loop. Um, and every kid gets a football, gets a flyer of how to improve your mental fitness. Mm. Uh, it's a big issue. Like I, um, um, I talked to 2,500 players last year uh, and I don't have a job because I love doing it. I'm helping people and it's a big issue like Luke said. Mm. And like um, five months ago, 11-year-old boy committed suicide after footy training in Orange. And I have to get counselling for the team, and and that, and it's a big worry, you know. Mm. Um, um, I, kids these days, adults have created a problem making them soft. Like um, mm. they don't get reprimanded for being in trouble anymore because that's bullying, or that's your your parents mm. that couldn't can't do this. Mm. Um, I find when kids fall over, a doctor will give them a tablet now instead of saying keep going. Mm. Um, yeah, it's a big problem, but I I love it and. Um, uh, hopefully I'll do about 4,000 this year. It's interesting because we talked earlier about great people make great club participants. We're talking yeah. about players. And um, any of us who've played sport at any competitive level, I don't know whether you hit a golf ball on the weekend in C grade or whatever you do, you would know that if you're having troubles at home or whatever personally, it affects your play. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know anyone who can actually switch off completely and perform at their best if they've got a trauma going on at home or they've had yeah. an argument with their partner or whatever. So uh, it, it's 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 one of those things where it's just so obvious, isn't it? Well, great Peter Moore first said when I signed you at the club, he used to say to us, happy wife, happy life. Yep. And I mean, it's old-fashioned, but the basis of it is – The base yeah, of it is yeah. exactly what we try and teach now. So – for us, it's and, and what Paul does, it's, it's about education. So the biggest thing we found too, we only don't get to the players at the you know the the Harold Mats and the development squads in the SG ball. We actually get to the parents too, because mm. we need to let them know what we're educating them at this um, at this level, so they know when they you know transition into maybe you know a, a one of our squads, they're going to get taken after. You know, it's it's all about you know the three big things, and Paul, you will agree here. The three big things um, in regards to our space, well-being space, are uh, diet and what you put in your body. Um, mm -hmm. The second one is exercise, so fitness, obviously at elite level. And the third one's probably the most important, Bill, but no one ever, ever, you know, guesses it when I speak. It's sleep hygiene. Yeah, oh, You can yeah, never get yeah. back sleep once it's gone. It is so important. And I know, you know, for my own mental health, when I start getting a bit tatty and a bit, you know, Yep. annoyed it's because my sleep's out so that one's a massive one so they're the three big ones we try and you know constantly monitor with our players during the year and and let's face it competitive athletes are at an age where the average person that age isn't thinking about that stuff very oh. much Billy, we had, but like, yeah. the people watching this 
hopefully understand that you have to be active. If you don't use it, you lose it, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I train the first thing every morning for six six days. Mm -hmm. And and I do it mainly for my mind, Mm. right? I feel stronger and fitter now because I do weights and and, and interval training on the bike. And it's only for 40 minutes every day. But I feel the best. I get in the shower and I go, happy days. There's times where I could have just went back to sleep and I used to do that, right? So the worst thing for people out there who are listening is when you feel crap – or you're hungover from a big night, is to lay on the lounge and do nothing because you'll be tired again tomorrow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Get out and be active. That's really good advice because yeah. a lot of stuff people are saying, even to older people. I mean, I'm over 60 now, so a lot of older people sort of think, oh, well, I don't ask, uh, um, exercise the last thing I need to think about. But you, you, they're saying now older people should be getting out and exercising more as well. So there's a yeah. lesson well, there for anyone listening. Especially I'm 57. I know I look older. I've had a hard life, right? <laughs> well but, said. Yeah, good said. I did get a head like this chicken flowers, <laughs> all right? Okay? you got to remember, I won three grand finals, but I got knocked out six times in my first year. So there has to be some chromosomes, right? But what City, I'm, New South Wales, kangaroo tours. Yeah. Yeah, very, going, very good resume. No, no, He's forgotten all that though. No, no, but, no, yeah. but what I'm saying is doing light weights, you have to do all the time. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. It, you need your joints and you need, like, I, I was walking a lot. And I did Roy Simmons' walk last year. We both Luke did. And yeah. Bar, yeah, 20 Ks we walked, right? But I, I can't do it this year because it hurts my knees walking. Right. We're riding a stationary bike, lubricates my knees, and yeah. now I don't have troubles getting too. in and out of a car yeah. or sitting down behind a desk. It's yeah. true. So you have to do little light weights because weights will uh, increase your metabolism, burn off calories, and make you feel better. And that's what the older you get, the more you got to do it. Yeah. Would you just, agree, Luke? Yeah, yeah no, definitely. Yeah. Like I try and do something yeah, yeah. every day. Just what it is. Because you put a bit of weight on it. <laughs> Jeez. Well, well, hopefully. No, mirrors, Bill. <laughs> no, no, no. Were you eating biscuits before this? <laughs> Were you? Yeah. <laughs> no, but you used to walk around like you're an Iron Man. No, <laughs> well, I you do so. Well, why did you have your shirt off before? <laughs> this is a stitch Sorry, up, Bill. Bill. I know, it's all right. <laughs> I'm just being honest. No, because you embarrassed me. I Will. wouldn't take my shirt off, right? <laughs> anyway, keep going. No, I just want to finish up with something else you touched on, mate. And look, I, I've done a number of sports chat shows over the last 10 years or so, and I've noticed in the last five at least a lot of junior coaches talking about this lack of resilience. And I guess, you know, it's the generation of parents who yeah. are to blame. That's a whole other topic. But given this factor that you've talked about, mate, um, how much responsibility do clubs have when they're dealing with young people who are not resilient, and if it's a generational thing, so be it. But what? How much can you do? That's sort of without getting out of your lane, if you know what well, I mean. Well, I spend more time. They spend more time with me than their family. Right. So I got a massive responsibility. I'm talking about our junior rep coaches and staff. Yep. Two years ago, for the first time in every year, it happens here. I make our manager and our head coach um, do a first aid mental health course. You know, to teach them how to speak to players, what to say in different situations. Mm. And then through that, it, you know, the relationship comes closer and you can build that resilience and, and build a lot of things yeah. out of that, you know, building better people. So, like, yeah. what I do, it costs the junior league, it's free. Right. Yep. So I reach out, say, every club in the junior rugby league of Canterbury Bank Sound, Paul Langmack, New South Wales rugby league, we've partnered up with the Bulldogs, Mental Fitness, only – 25 minutes mm. for training in the dressing room. It's called the change rooms, changing rooms, because you go in and come in a different person. The like kids are going to get a football. Half the clubs don't even get back to me. Like it's, it's, it's disappointing. It's a great initiative. Really? Yeah. I'm, I, I get angry. That, and it's free. Yeah. That, yeah, it's free. So like I had Leichhardt Wanderers uh, um, just last week. The a girl coaches the girls A grade. I can, I've heard about it. Can you help? I'm now on uh, next week doing Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday – 20 teams. That's The whole awesome. club. Mm, Every kid's going to get a football. And then I say to them, like, mate, don't tell your parents you're going to bed and for the next hour or so you're under the sheets playing on your phone. You're going to be tired and angry and not be a nice person. Well, it's funny you say that, Bill. So was it last year pre-season or the year before, I did a survey on the play sleep hygiene and it come back was terrible. Really? Uh, we had players going to bed – I think it was 80% of our plays going to bed from midnight to 2 o'clock. It's disgraceful. It's social media. It's it's PlayStation. It's And that's that keeps you awake too. Of course if you're it does. That's the Blu-rays in the phone keep yeah. you awake, yeah. right? 
And you've got to get off your phone two hours before you want to go to sleep, I tell them. Sure. And you've yeah. got to get in a routine, go to bed the same night time, and you're a better person. Yeah. Before we finish, uh, and we can come back to this subject because there's so much depth to it, if you are part of a junior club and you're interested in what Langers is talking about, mate, how yeah, can they find out. you? Well, reach out to the club. Yeah, reach Email out to me. Email Luke yeah, yeah. or to you, Luke. Yeah, Sorry. And Luke yeah, will right. pass them on to me. Yeah. Um, because the Bulldogs are, are doing it. They're the only NRL yeah. club doing it with New South Wales Rugby League. And I'm so proud of that. So if you're out there part of a junior league club or your kid goes to a school in the Canterbury area, yep. well, mate, you could be living out in the bush, whatever. Don't, you don't have to be in the Canterbury area because New South Wales Rugby League covers all of New South Wales. Mm. Reach out to Luke Goodwin. Yep. Or, um, yeah, reach out yeah, to reach Luke. reach out to me first. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And he'll pass them on and I'll contact you straight away. Beautiful. After the break, this is Paul Langmack and Luke Goodwin. We'll deal with some dog days. Uh, more nostalgia stories coming up. Let's talk about the dog days. Yes, dog days indeed. We've got some great stories coming up on Bulldogs Unleashed. Brought to you by Reclaim the Game and our special guests this week are Luke Goodwin and Paul Langmack. I want to start by putting into context the whole South Sydney Canterbury thing because uh, one of the great ironies of rugby league is that back in 1967 when Souths won the premiership, ending the great St George Mm. 11-year streak, it was actually the Bulldogs who beat the Dragons that year and knocked them out and then went on to play Souths and lose in the grand final. So we we shouldered the burden for the entire game of rugby league and ending the Dragons, well, it'll probably never be broken. And I think it was Ross Canterbury halfback through the intercept for Bob McCarthy. In the grand final. Yes, and he, yeah. he ran 60 metres to score. Les Johns was in that team. Uh, Kevin Ryan. Bobby Hagan went on to be a senior, of course, It was quite ironic because Kevin Ryan was at St. George during a great streak of 11 years. He was <laughs> and then he, come, he went yeah. to Canterbury yeah. and he was a, he, he beat the team. I can call you David Middleton. <laughs> You're very good. Have you seen him? Ooh. I don't know if Middleton would be happy nah, with that. No, I'm a fascinist, the mate. <laughs> There's, so there's a lot of stories, and we won't be able to get to them all, and there are plenty more editions of Bulldogs Unleashed, we hope, <laughs> if they let us keep doing them, to tell these great stories. But one of them that I hadn't been aware of, that Lang, as you want to tell, is the time Gus Gould saved your life. Yeah, he did, actually. Um, um, Gus uh, played at Newtown, played at the Dogs. Um, then he went to South in 1986. George Pickens was coach, now the minor premiers. And it was a Monday night game here. And there's going to be 25,000 here on a Monday night. And um, we used to love playing teams like Balmain, Saints and South because there was confrontations. Like they had good forwards, we had good forwards. Like yeah. Parramatta were a great team, but they were more out in the backs with Crone and Kenny and Ella and all them. Um, so I remember training on the Sunday and uh, we are training out the back and Warren Ryan, our second grade coach, was Tony Charlton, who just passed away. Bubbles, yeah. yeah. Um, no, Boss Hogg. Bubbles oh, that's his brother. Yeah, 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 so right. we used to call him Boss Hogg out of the Dukes of Hazard, <laughs> right? So Warren, Warren Ryan, our coach, Gus was playing for South. He was in the second row. And they had blokes like Les Davidson, Ian Roberts, Fannick, David Boyle, blokes that could fight and that, and they were tough blokes, right? And um, and we had Kelly and Tunks and Gillespie and all these other blokes that were tough blokes that could fight too. I couldn't, but anyway. So <laughs> Boss Hogg, um, the second grade coach, is told, can you go and ring up, ring up your mate and see if the fight's on, right, in the first 10 minutes. And there was no <laughs> mobile phones then. And he walked like 50 metres. He turned back around and said, Warren, I need 20 cents for the for the oh. <laughs> I always remember it. So he, he comes back half an hour later and he said, yep, the stink's on. So we get so we go to the game. This is fair to go. playing stink. Yeah, yeah. So South, that was the old days. Yeah, so South knew they were going to bung a stink on and we had Billy Johnson who fought for the middle yeah, way, yeah, yeah. Tyler Australia's hooker. So Phoenix figured I could bash him because I'm twice the size of him. And this is true. So before the game... Warren Ryan puts a video on of Marvellous Hagler for oh. Thomas Hearns, two and a half rounds of the middleweight champion of the world of Mayhem. You, if you haven't wow. seen yeah, it, get on great. YouTube. It's unbelievable. Yeah. So we're watching that. I've got goosebumps now. And Peter Kelly says, one in all in. And I'm thinking, oh, shit, I can't fight for shit, right? <laughs> I'm going to die if I get this day. This is true. First time I ever got scared before a game because you get scared during the game sometimes, right? Anyway, so the game's going, 25,000. We hate them. They hate us. And, but the best part about it is after the game, you go up the club, you have a beer, mate, that was good, I whacked you in that, right? So um, I'm basically um, 
I'm, I'm very scared, right? And, <laughs> and the scrum goes, no, Mario Fennec pulls Billy Johnson's jersey over Straight his head. away. Starts Boom. punching him fair in the head about 10 minutes into the game, right? And Phil Gould was second row for South and that, right? And then I get smashed from behind. I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to, I'm like, Davidson, Roberts, they're going to kill me, you know? So I get smashed from behind and it's Gus. He said, stay down. We're too smart for these dickheads, right? And he laid on the ground. <laughs> he saved me life. Fighting. Yeah, he saved me life. And then <laughs> he did. It's a true story. It's not the story I was thinking no, of when you told me. I thought you might have been drowning or yeah. something. But. No, he saved me life. <laughs> and then, so then, because I used to, like, I've got uh. a very good memory, as you know, and Warren Ryan was ahead of his time. We'd know what players were going to do. So I'd yell out if um, – Michael yeah. O'Connor had a right foot side, so he got yeah. the ball and say, what's his right foot? And he wouldn't step off his right. So I'm yelling out the gas, you know, yeah, it's been stung by a thousand bees ever <laughs> run. Right? <laughs> Beasting Beasting head. Head. Yeah, right. So anyway. Um, <laughs> David Boyd says that to me. Yeah, see? How's beasting get going? Yeah, right? Right? Were you, were you talking about having a relationship with the Bulldogs before? I don't know how long this is going to last. No, so he's he he was playing. He was the biggest halfback I've ever seen. He was playing first receiver. I had Tucker Coleman, but Gus goes get out of the way. He was running the show, and every time I'd say kill him, cement, he wouldn't run the ball. The minute I didn't say anything, he dummy ran Boom, through, scored, dry. did it again. Podgy scores. He got me in the match. We got beat, but we say he saved me life. But anyway, <laughs> well look, we don't want to say in any way. That we condone what used to go on back in the old no, but, days. No, Apologies for laughing, but that's the way it was. Yeah, that's just the way it was. I was lucky, and yeah. you were lucky. We grew up in a good era. Yep. Petrol was yep. cheap. You talked to your neighbours, yep. and the footy was great. Right? <laughs> it was. It was. Yeah. But and you, you, you go hey. home when the lights came on. Yeah. <laughs> Even <laughs> hey. drink yeah. water out of the hose. How, how many times <laughs> did your parents yell out? Dinner time, next try wins. Right? <laughs> <laughs> how good was well, it? Two brothers. Back. Exactly what and happened. And I lived in Cabramatta. Right, we live in the Ask Commission. I was ten years of age. We'd walk for an hour to the station at Cabramatta, get on the train to Central, walk from Central to the cricket ground, watch the cricket. All Crazy. the mates at ten, hang out at the back of the Red Rattler, hang out the train, get home at nine, and they go have a good day. Oh, it was great. <laughs> at 10, ten years old. <laughs> and look, and getting back to the footy, even in high school and park footy back in those days, they were spear tackling and all sorts yeah. of things. It was just, it was in the game, was given. and that was just the way it was. Sorry, I'm not trying yeah. to take over, but I have some good stories. It sounds like uh, it. Uh, uh, no, good experiences, <laughs> yeah. memories, and that's yeah. why we play for sport. Um, we don't have to talk to our mates uh, every week. You catch up, might see someone for six months, and there's a bond there forever. You pick it and up that's straight the beauty away. of yeah. team sport, right? Yeah. So just quickly, we played uh, South at the cricket ground. They call it the Anzac Day Massacre. Um, uh, we kicked off, I think it was 1986 too. Yes, it was. Yeah, 86, yeah. I, th- I know where you're going so with there's, this. So there's six yeah. concussions in one year haven't affected me yet, right? But we kick <laughs> we off. Have. Not, Ross your, not your looks either. Ross Harrington, they used to call him the locomotion, right? Big bloke. And he was running flat chat off the kickoff. Peter Kelly just goes whack and knocks his head straight on the hill. And Mick Stone goes, you're off. So Kel beat Bullfrog and Punchy Nelson off the ground. That's how quick it was. The first I think it was, was 30 seconds. No, it was I the think. first tackle. Yeah, it's the quickest well, send off, see, right? Yeah. So anyway, he goes to the judiciary on the Monday, and Bullfrog was there with him, and Jim Comins was wiping everyone out for foul play, and he s- says to Peter Kelly, "Mr. Kelly, you keep saying you didn't hit him in the head. We've watched it six times. Why do you say this?" And he said, "Because when I hit him in the head, it sounds different." <laughs> <laughs> he got six weeks. Wasn't too smart, but anyway. I remember Bullfrog telling me that he was walking out to the sideline yes. and Kel was walking the other Passed way. And Bullfrog him. thought he left his mouth guard in the dressing room or something. <laughs> He's a good man, Pete. Did he use a mouth guard in those days? Anyway, I don't know. So what about this Kel. one? Sorry, I'm not taking over, but anyway. Um, <laughs> Do you no. want to swap chairs with Bill? No, no. no Bill's no, doing a great I'm, job. I'm happy. I'm happy. A good job. I'm a good listener. I've got one with yeah. Phil Good. 1988, we, we win the comp, 84, 85, we lose 86, 87, we don't make the semis. Warren goes to Balmain, or he might have went the year later. He didn't coach that year. And Gus and takes over. Chris no Anderson <clears throat> couldn't get back from England uh, in, on time to coach, first grade. So Bullfrog thought, oh, we won't run anywhere. We've bought no one and we'll put this 29-year-old in who was coaching second grade under Warren, right? right. So Gus is the coach and we're doing really well and um, – the third last game we're playing Canberra down in Canberra, Seaford Oval, and uh, they have Meninga, Daly, Stewart, Clyde, Lazarus, Chicka Ferguson. They had a great side. And 
in those days was the top five. So if you finished first, second or third, you got two bites of the cherry in the semi. If you lost, you still stayed alive. So it was a big game. Whoever wins is going to finish third. So Gus, 29 years of age. Steve Moran is 35. Terry Lamb's 32. They're older than the coach, right? This is his That's first crazy, year. He's never it? coached crazy. before. Never coached. He says, listen, what we're going to do, we're going to um, train Saturday morning and then we're going down to Canberra. And we're going to stay overnight. What? Overnight? He said, I want you to do whatever you do down here in Sydney, do it in Canberra. Good as go. So we train. We This is a true story. I, I draw, we draw, Gus is driving the bus. Pick up Terry Lamb at the Twin Willows and he walks out with two six-packs of vodka and orange UDLs. Mate, you ask Terry Lamb. You get him back on, he'll confirm it, right? And with the, this bloke is getting five hundred dollars a game. He's the eight thousand. He's going to play the biggest game of his life on the next day. So we at this is Bathurst. We get the camera. We get the camera. Why'd you go to the Bathurst? Now, when we got the by the time we got the Bathurst, McDonald's on the way, right? There was no nutrition then, right? So anyway, by the time we got the camera, we're playing the next day, the biggest game of the year, right? And the 29 year old coach is driving the bus. He's up 9,000 from the hooker. The hooker's down. Joey Thomas. So yeah. We got the camera. Joey lost 14,000. He had everyone. And he's getting $500 a game, right? Anyway, Terry Lamb drank 12 year deals. Feel good at to carry him off the bus and put him to bed. And we have a team meeting. Our best player. Is drunk and asleep. What was the score the next day? No, it gets better. Oh. So we get in the dressing room. <laughs> it. It's, not, it's a true story. There's no phones. It was unreal, right? So we go have a team meeting, and Gus goes, "Look, we know our best player. Don't panic. He does this every Saturday." And the Willows. And I'm not. I don't pray, but that night I pray <laughs> that our best player didn't have a hangover next day. It's true. I couldn't make it up, mate. You ask Terry. Right? So I'm thinking, oh, our best player, he's going to have a hangover. He'll dehydrate, whatever. So we get out there and after 10 minutes, we're down 12 nil. It's true. So you've got to remember, Joey Thomas, our hooker, he's lost 14,000. He owes everyone on the bus. And he's getting 500 a game, bro. We're down 12 nil. Terry Lamb throws an intercept. Meninga scores behind the goalposts. And Terry says, listen, I'm telling you, Joey – if you've got a bonus to make the grand final, win the comp, yep, I guarantee you we'll win the comp if we can win now. I'm going to turn this all around, right? He said, how much you get in a bonus? 20 grand. He said, we go. We win 23-12 and it was the best and we won the comp. Wow. And it was amazing. And you ask Terry Lamb, he will verify it. I've got to ask Imagine him. drinking 12 UDLs and you've got to play the biggest game of your life next day. I prayed to God that he was all right. <laughs> Times have changed. <laughs> Langers, I, I, it's funny you should it's tell crazy. that story because I was just about to close the program by asking Luke, coming in on the back of that era, what you learned from those teams <laughs> in the 80s. <laughs> and I don't know what to ask you now. It's funny. I know Paul brought it up earlier. I, you know, I had some great coaches, but I learned more players. Off, off players. You but did. Bar was the first one. I was lucky enough, yep. as you know, work with Bar here. He taught me so much about family and life off the field. Mm. But on the field, I was that scared to do anything wrong because of him. Like he taught me – I remember going down injured when we didn't have the ball once. He goes, don't you ever do it again. My rest of my career, I didn't – even I, I remember having – I'd done my ankle really bad and I'd get up because I was never – I always remember Bar. But some of the stuff – he Bar wasn't a um, – I'm not going to sit here and say he was the most gifted player ever, but – Toughest. He was the toughest and – he, he didn't say much, but he led by actions. Yeah. He right. was that tough. He was that resilient. He was a legend. As, as, just watching the game, was there ever an offload or any oh. bit of space on the field when we had the ball that Bar wasn't there? But I used to say – The intuition was amazing. What this? One day I said to him, mate, how come you always score on the tries? He goes, when there's a break, I head straight up the middle up of the, the middle. field yeah. Yeah. because the ball's going to come back. Yeah. And, mate, he just loved it, you know. Yeah. Ellery Hanley knocked himself out in the 88 grand final on Bar's arm and he was a winner. <laughs> But can we just – I just wanted to mention one more thing. Yeah, sure. Because oh, I've got to go. Right? <laughs> but we'll, no, this is true. We'll Bill, get him back. Don't Bill, worry. Bill, 
I remember Luke, you played 1992 at Penrith. Yeah. It was his first game. So we're at West. We've got Lindna, Farrah, Gillespie, <laughs> Thomas. We, we win. Ronnie gives that. And I remember he was playing fullback for Penrith, Penny Park. I pushed him off for my fourth try, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> you remember this? Is this one of the bar stories? No, it's I not. Know, it's a I good pushed memory. him off for my fourth try. And when he was first got in the grade, he was just, had this skinny body, a big head. He looked like a chopper chop, right? So as we're walking back, I felt sorry. For this poor kid, right? Uh, and I picked him up off the ground. He said, Thanks, Mr. Langback. And I said, Son, train hard, be good to your parents. And look what he's doing now. I, he took my advice. It's true. Uh, Did they remember me pushing you off for me fourth try? I don't know about fourth try, Paul. Listen, like, I wasn't really down for tackle. Look at my shoulder. Seriously. <laughs> Thank goodness Chuppa Chup didn't stick. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, this big yeah, head is I've got Lu- Yeah, I think it's better than Lucy. See, I, no, no, <laughs> no, because I hate losing weight because it makes me head look bigger. <laughs> Uh, you've been listening to Paul Langmack and Luke Goodwin on uh, Dog Days. Uh, this is Unleashed, brought to you by Reclaim the Game, and we'll be back again next week. 